please join me in welcoming August De Los Reyes. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Uh-oh. I hear some people. So um, my name is August. Uh, um, my preferred pronouns are uh, he and him, but literally I will respond to any pronoun. <laughs> and um, I'm a designer. It's one of those things where, like, you're sitting on a plane, and you get to that point where the person next to you asks you what you do, and I say I'm a designer, and usually I get one of two responses. Do you design clothes, or uh, do you do interior design? And uh, what I actually design is uh, technology, uh, as you'll see. And when I go through this talk, um, uh, even though it's about design, I believe the design is a fundamental human drive. Uh, and the, in all of our jobs, in our everyday tasks, we're really performing acts of design. So please listen <clears throat> to what I have to share through that lens. So when I was first invited to uh, speak today, uh, I was an employee at Google. Uh, but now I work at a small startup, which you probably haven't heard of, called Varo. And uh, we're on track to being the first uh, nationally chartered uh, mobile-only bank uh, in the United States. And the reason why, the problem that we're solving is that um, there are these things called banking deserts, uh, where there are communities that are no longer being served uh, by traditional banks. And what's interesting about these banking deserts is they're also accompanied by healthcare deserts, uh, education, groceries, pharma pharmacies. A lot of social services are uh, going away from rural communities uh, and certain areas and urban centers. And so uh, one opportunity is to come in and help provide services that were no longer available. So that being said, um, I used to work at Xbox, and here I am uh, at the <laughs> Xbox studio. Uh, and then about four years ago, um, I decided to go work at Pinterest. Uh, so there's a little costume change at Pinterest. Um, and then, uh, um, and then uh, at Google. And what was so interesting about this is when I worked at Xbox, uh, when I told people that I worked at Xbox, people would say, oh, my son or my husband or my boyfriend would love to meet you. And then when I worked at Pinterest, I would hear, my wife or my top. <laughs> or my girlfriend would love to meet you. And then when I worked at Google, no one wanted to meet me. I don't know. <laughs> so um, I've been a designer for almost 30 years. Um, and uh, I was thinking back to my early days as a designer, and I was reading Oscar Wilde's fairy tales. And then one of the characters said that all good storytellers nowadays start with the end, go to the beginning, and finish with the middle. And so I'm going to attempt to do that today. And so I'm going to begin with a provocation and a confession. So the provocation is this. Whenever I see a bendable straw, I see a love story. And I will explain that uh, in the rest of the talk. And the second, which is my confession, uh, is that I'm not a very well-rounded person. Um, all I think about, all I do is design. Um, and I look at the world. Uh, through design. In fact, uh, uh, when I was asked to provide what I do in my spare time for my introduction, I was challenged to think of something that didn't make me sound uh, too not well-rounded, but like going to museums is what I do. All right, so just as a couple of examples of how obsessed with design I am, I have to caveat this by saying, I prepared this presentation long before I knew the, the Department of Licensing was a sponsor here. So when I moved to Washington uh, in 2003, one thing that would drive me crazy is that there was too much space between the W and the A. And it, it would make me crazy. Um, but I did check uh, on the DOL website, and it looks like um, they kind of fixed fix that part. Um, other things I do in my spare time, I design conceptual furniture. This is something called a chair for birds. Uh, and then um, I don't know if uh, 
um, you've heard of this documentary called Helvetica. There is a documentary about this typeface Helvetica. And in it, um, there's an angry Italian designer named Massimo Vignelli. And he was the designer that literally brought Helvetica to the United States in the 1950s. Uh, and I had the uh, honor of being uh, trained uh, by Vignelli. So that's why this entire presentation are in his two favorite fonts, uh, Helvetica and Bodoni. So um, my career kind of spans a tale of three cities. If you think about my three decades as a designer, and the first is Boston. So um, I was a designer in Boston in the 90s, and I did all sorts of new digital things uh, with the web first starting to happen. And the reason why these pictures are so, so tiny is because back in the 90s, the monitors were these huge CRT things, and the maximum resolution was 800 by 600. And now we jump ahead, and they all look like postage stamps. Um, and then, when the dot-com bubble burst, I packed up my bags and moved to Amsterdam. And there were kind of there were three things that I took away from that experience. I went to work for a company called Philips, where they make shavers and medical equipment and TVs. And this was my first exposure to software and hardware uh, working together. In fact, uh, Philips' vision for the future suggested that the home of the future, which is depicted in the bottom of this picture, will look a lot more like the home of the past, which is at the top of this picture, than the home of the second, where our, our, our living spaces are cluttered uh, with devices and boxes of electronics. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the projects that I had worked on, this was a concept car for a tablet uh, with a kind of fabric top and a multi-touch screen, but none of these technologies existed at the time. This was designed in 2001, and we knew where technologies were going, and so this was kind of a concept car of what a tablet could be. And now, in 2019, you could probably go to Best Buy and, and pick up something like this. The second thing uh, that I picked up living in the Netherlands is a tolerance for really, really long words. <laughs> so this word in Dutch uh, means uh, the, the police for foreign residents. So all foreigners that live in the Netherlands have to go register uh, with this department. And in Amsterdam, uh, this department happened to be on this street. Uh, which is uh, Johan Hausingalan. And um, I'm going to break it down for you. So, Lan at the end means lane. And so, if you look at the part in the red, uh, that's actually someone named Johan Hausinga. And so, like a good, curious arrival uh, to a country, um, I decided to look up who Johan Hausinga is or was. And it turned out that Hausinga is considered the greatest 20th century. Dutch historian, and his seminal work was a book called Homo Ludens, which means the being at play. And um, Housinga suggested that the notion of play has somehow been trivialized into just the um, area of sports and leisure, but if we look through the history of culture, the idea of play is something that we base a lot of formal religious rituals around, uh, ritualized combat like dueling, theater, the play, the element of play is at the core of a lot of communities and a lot of activities. And because of the Industrial Revolution, play has somehow uh, been marginalized. But it was then, and this was about 2000, the, that seed got planted, and I got obsessed with the idea of play. So um, here's how my three years in the Netherlands played out. So the first year, I thought, wow, this is a designer's paradise. Everything is so well designed. Look at the stripes on those police cars. And then the second year, I just kind of got into the groove of my Dutch colleagues, where we bike to work and then have a beer and rinse and repeat. And then the third year, all I wanted to do was go home. There's nothing like living overseas to make you feel in touch. Uh, with your own national identity. And when I first moved to Europe, I thought, wow, 10 weeks vacation a year sounds great. Uh, but then I realized how American I was, where I felt like I'd used all my vacation, and then 
HR would call me around November and say, you have about six weeks of vacation left. You need to take the rest of the year off. And if you wanted to have a meeting or get anything done over the summer, forget it, because everyone was off on their like five, six weeks vacations. So um, I really just wanted to come back home. And so uh, this is how I ended up in Seattle. I got a recruiting call uh, from Microsoft. And full disclosure, um, Microsoft had been a company that I've, I had kind of held with a bit of disdain. And so, um, but I, I went ahead and accepted uh, the role at Microsoft and I moved to Seattle, to Bellevue more specifically, and I thought, here's the plan. Maybe I'll spend one or two years at Microsoft and then move elsewhere. And it turned out that I stayed there for nearly 14 years. And part of it too is I realized the, some of the work that we did impacted millions, hundreds of millions of people's lives in hopefully a positive way. Um, a couple of examples of the roles that I played uh, while I was there, I was um, part of a group called the Windows Hardware Innovation Group. And this was a hardware group, but not the kind that um, made the keyboards and the mice that we all know. This was a group that was in Windows, and it was to make features of Windows uh, feel better through hardware. And so a couple of examples are my boss, Steve, uh, he popularized the scroll wheel on the mouse. And the guy, Carl, who sat next to me, he helped pick the colors of the connectors uh, on the backs of PCs. <laughs> and so one of the assignments I had is there was a new version of Windows coming out. And my boss said, I need you to design the spec for the new Windows key on the keyboard, because no one's pressing that key. So we need to uh, come up with something new. And I thought, oh, this is easy. One key, I could probably get this done in three, four, five days. The project ended up taking six months. And here's the reason why. Because you have to take into account every safety and health regulation in every market on the planet that Windows is being sold. Uh, and my favorite is in Germany, there's actually a safety regulation for the amount of light that can bounce off of your keyboard into your eyes. And so we'd have to like tweak uh, the textures of the keys uh, to make sure that we met uh, regulations like that. So if you ever see the Windows key with the little dome and the circle, that, that, that's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then uh, I also worked on Microsoft Surface back when it was a table, uh, before it became a laptop. But in, in 2013, I kind of landed my dream gig at Microsoft, which was to lead design uh, at Xbox and uh, um, the Xbox One. And um, during that time, uh, um, about six months into the role, I had become really obsessed with getting a good, good night's sleep. And in the kind of obsessive way that I did, I just went full tilt into researching things like thread count and strains of cotton and how many layers you want to make your bed to have the best night's sleep. And um, during that time, I had bought, because apparently you want a different duvet for the summer than the winter. And so um, I ended up buying this really overstuffed uh, duvet, which made my bed look a lot bigger than it was. And it just so happened that um, I thought I was falling back into my bed to take a nap, uh, but I actually fell and hit my back hit the rail of the bed, which caused a, an indetectable fracture. So um, I started not feeling well a few days after that fall. And after a few uh, visits to the emergency room, uh, because of miscommunication uh, and some other issues, uh, I ended up in this wheelchair. Uh, so I'm paralyzed from the chest down. So that's the only downer, I hope, of uh, this discussion. I mean, I, I could have a whole other presentation about that. Um, but what I want to talk about is the lemonade that I made uh, out of this situation. So um, I was in the hospital uh, for about six months, uh, and I was out of, uh, uh, I was learning my new normal and away from the office, but I figured the thing that would get me uh, to um, really recover 
was to get back to work. And it just so happened that I returned back to work uh, the day before the new Xbox launched. So I missed all of the arguing and the back and forth with engineering <laughs> and marketing. I was like, here's your design. Uh, I'm going to the hospital. And then I come back, and the whole thing gets launched. But while I'd been away, the entire company went through this massive reorg, and I came back to work with a new job. In fact, all of the heads of design of the different departments now reported to the same person. And uh, this person, uh, Albert, um, he challenged us with coming up with a design agenda. In other words, a common set of themes that spanned all the products uh, that we were in charge of. And the one, the, the one theme that I'd been super interested in was obviously accessibility, given that um, this was my new normal. And in doing so, we explored concepts like universal design uh, and inclusive design, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. But um, one thing that I want to be super clear about is that accessibility is not either universal design or inclusive design. We often uh, use these terms interchangeably, but they are not the same thing. Um, accessibility is an outcome. Uh, it is an outcome, and the two things below are two of many approaches to achieve this outcome, where universal design, on the one hand, kind of focuses on the end result to make sure that Let's, let's build a space or an experience and then make it accessible. While inclusive design is kind of different. It starts at the very beginning where it looks at, uh, at someone who has an ability difference and is excluded uh, from a situation. And um, what's interesting about inclusive design is it was prompted uh, by the redefinition of disability by uh, the UN in 2011 which uh, suggested that we move from the medical model of disability to the societal model. In other words, prior to that, disability was considered something physiological or cognitive, like there was something different about your body, therefore you're disabled. But the societal model uh, approaches it differently. It says that disability is a mismatch between any person's spectrum of abilities and the environment or artifacts with which they interact. So disability is a mismatch. Uh, that it's not on me, I'm not disabled, other than I only feel disabled when I'm in situations or environments that prevent me uh, from uh, experiencing it. So the kind of damning conclusion to all of this is that disability is in fact designed. But here's the interesting thing about inclusive design. As I started looking more into inclusive design, I found out that this was a great way to innovate. So let's look at the remote control. The original design intent of the remote control in the 50s and 60s was actually for people with mobility differences, people who couldn't get up and cross the room easily uh, to control their television. But the beautiful thing about inclusive design is that you solve for one, and it benefits everyone. So you jump ahead a few decades, and every one of us expects a remote control uh, as a standard feature of our televisions. And the list goes on. Um, the early email protocols by Vint Cerf were actually invented uh, by Vint, who is hard of hearing, to communicate easily with his wife, who is deaf. The keyboard, and this is kind of my favorite, was invented by an Italian aristocrat whose lover, a blind Contessa, um, wanted to exchange letters back and forth, and she didn't want assistants writing the letters so that their communications could be a lot more intimate. So he invented the keyboard, which later became uh, the typewriter, and eventually uh, we all have a keyboard in our pocket, I think. Um, uh, look at closed captioning. Uh, when was the last time you were in a noisy bar or at the airport and you took advantage of the closed captioning? Uh, and then the telephone was invented by Alexander Graham Bell as an assistive device for the deaf and hard of hearing, uh, the electric toothbrush, the cruise control. Cruise control was invented by a blind engineer who wanted to be able to drive again. 
and then audiobooks, and the list goes on and on. Which brings me to the bendable straw. <laughs> so um, the bendable straw was invented in around 1910, 1920s, in San Francisco. And it's kind of ironic that San Francisco is one of the first cities to ban bendable straws or ban <laughs> straws altogether. Um, but what happened with the bendable straw is um, this guy uh, uh, brought his daughter uh, to a soda fountain and ordered a milkshake and realized as they were sitting at the counter, um, his little five-year-old daughter was fussing with the drink because she couldn't get to the milkshake because the straw went above her head. And so um, he was a bit of a tinker, and when he got home, he took the straw, put a screw inside the straw, and wrapped dental floss around the grooves, and thus creating the bendable straw. Um, and uh, now his daughter could enjoy her milkshake, and uh, we en all enjoy the bendable straw. But the thing about this, and all the previous examples, uh, is that all of these inventions were kind of born out of love. Uh, the, these are all love stories. And this is why, when I look at the bendable straw, uh, I see a love story. So to think about inclusive design, it's really these kind of three steps. First, identify some form of exclusion, whether it's you yourself or someone else is being excluded from an experience or a service or uh, an everyday occurrence, and, and then solve for that person, and solve at the personal level. Assuming that if you solve at the personal level, it'll benefit others. And in doing so, you can start to scale uh, your solution. And this is kind of like the high-level approach to inclusive design, which we'll revisit in a second. So um, the famed uh, American designer Charles Eames Eames said, design for someone you love, that someone might be you. So in this way, we think of inclusive design and we go through the world and we think about love stories. But here's the thing. Uh, I kind of got into it, but um, and there was a bit of traction around it. Now inclusive design is kind of a popular thing. And I knew that I could do something more, something more besides uh, in the service of video games. So uh, here's a bit of a humble brag. After uh, inclusive design got traction and we won our second technical Emmy uh, for the Xbox, um, I decided to uh, move to California uh, and join Pinterest. Um, and while I was there, um, we also helped make inclusive design, uh, create inclusive design solutions uh, for a visual search engine for people uh, with low vision or who are blind. So this brings me to the second half of this talk, which is if disability is designed, couldn't the reverse be true? Couldn't well-being be designed as well? And the answer is yes. And this is where my obsession with play has come, come into uh, this discussion, because of video games. And now let me explain. So what is the design intent of any video game? It is to make you feel something. It is to generate a certain set of emotions. And video game designers do this really, really well. There is a whole science to generating very specific emotions. And they use this framework called the Mechanics, Dynamics, and Aesthetic Framework, which I'll explain in a moment. So mechanics um, are the one-to-one -one relationship uh, between, uh, between a user's input or their actions and the system's response. So an example of a mechanic here is if I push a button, the little avatar jumps. If I push the directional pad, the avatar runs. And I could do a combination of two where there's a running jump. But literally, a mechanic is just one action and the system's response. And uh, in non-video game terms, there are mechanics for the game of chess. There are 91 rules for the game of chess. Uh, the game of soccer has 17 rules or 17 mechanics. And um, uh, these are examples of the mechanics of the system. So once you have your rule set and you introduce a person to actually try to go through the rule set, you start creating something called a dynamic. 
And the computer term for this is the runtime behavior. So now you have a person engaging uh, with the mechanics of the system. And like with, even though the rules of chess have been the same for centuries, because people bring in their own experiences and they're both, they bring in their state of mind, uh, no two chess games in history have ever been the same. Same thing with soccer. Again, the rules are the same across every soccer game, but because of people, uh, they create different dynamics. And finally, there's the aesthetic outcome. The sum of all the dynamics of an experience actually creates the emotional response or the aesthetic of the experience. And so we see the entire spectrum uh, of emotions uh, that are born out of the very same small set of mechanics of any given system. And we start to see this uh, in um, uh, product design as well, where uh, if you notice that in really expensive kitchens, uh, uh, drawers that kind of slowly ease in instead of slamming shut, that's an example of a mechanic. Uh, or when you're uh, looking at a premium car and it has that kind of really satisfying feeling when you shut the door, that is a design mechanic to generate an emotion uh, that you're um, having a premium experience. And what's interesting about this is they form a directional stack. So from a player's point of view, a perceptor's point of view, they're first aware of the mechanics and then the dynamics, and I'm sorry, the aesthetics and then the dynamics and then the, the mechanics of the system. But as a designer creating the system, you're first and foremost aware of the mechanics of the system and eventually how the choices you make make people feel. But the only thing that can be designed, the only thing that you can affect uh, are the mechanics of the system. So in kind of looking, this is a still from a film uh, called The Powers of Ten. And in it, we're looking at the exact same point with different levels of resolution from the galactic all the way to the subatomic. And so I started thinking about the mechanics, dynamics, and aesthetics through different resolutions where there are components that comprise the mechanics of a system. And when you take the sum of all the mechanics of a system, it creates the dynamics of a system. And the sum of all the dynamics creates an emotional response. So what is the sum of all the emotional responses of any given experience? Well, it is a state of being. And if you want to use the fancy $100 word, it's the ontological level. Um, but really, the sum of all of your emotional states at any given moment describe your state of being. And so here's the big idea, uh, that by designing the mechanics of whatever it is we do in your day-to-day -day jobs, if you think about the mechanics, the individual tasks uh, that create a system response, we can ladder that up to creating human well-being. And the way we kind of measure the response of the mechanics of our actions are at three levels. First, um, we can be informed. We could kind of uh, read studies and reports about how certain changes in methods and processes affect the well-being of the people that use them. The next, which is even better, is you can actually observe how people are using uh, the things that you're helping to create. And finally, to engage directly with people who are using uh, the things or the services that you're producing and work with them directly to co-create or co-design that experience. And so in kind of thinking about this um, and going to something as broad and, and wide-reaching uh, as human well-being, I think it, there are these five themes to think about uh, in terms of uh, creating the mechanics of your system. First, uh, experiences should be inclusive, much like we talked about with the remote control. Second, the system should endure in the same sense that inclusive design is both a critique and a complement to accessibility. The, uh, creating design systems that endure are a critique and a complement to ecological sustainability. Take Legos, for example. This is a system where you could take a brick from your grandfather's set, from your father's set, from your child's set, even though your child's set could have Bluetooth radios and robotic arms, and they all work together. Um, the third 
is that our experiences can preserve dignity. Um, not only data dignity and technology, uh, but we can apply the rules of architecture and how people behave in particular spaces from the public to the semi-public to the semi-private to the private. The, in a public space like the highway, all rules are out the window. If someone cuts you off, you just see some of the uh, uh, worst behavior that, that's possible. And um, arguably, uh, at the far end of the spectrum, uh, the bedroom, which is private, um, also affects uh, limits on, uh, on behavior. But if you get into a semi-private space like the living room, it starts to create a certain sense of decorum. Same thing with like a restaurant in a semi-public space, which is arguably why it's good to have a breakup uh, from a relationship uh, in a restaurant, because it actually changes the behavior and hopefully preserves a bit of dignity. <laughs> uh, the fourth is that um, experiences sh should be playful. Uh, and what that means, really what that boils down to, uh, is that a lot of systems and processes, if you mess up, you feel like you're penalized, you feel like you're, you're punished. But the reason why video games, which players fail and fail and fail until they succeed, is because they don't feel diminished or punished or stupid uh, if they fail. So this is kind of the key to play. It's, uh, it's exploratory learning. And it's important that if people mess up, uh, they don't feel stupid. And finally, the last theme uh, is that, especially with technology nowadays, uh, that experience should be, should be calm. We're inundated with buzzers and notifications and texts and so forth. And I think there are explicit ways to keep situations calm. So in doing so, not only could we create human well-being, but I would argue a humane well-being. So I will leave you with these three provocations. Uh, the first is this. Seek out exclusion, whether it's for you or someone else, anyone who's been excluded, and use it as a starting point for improving the processes or the mechanics uh, of your system. And you'll be surprised in a good way where you might end up. So start with uh, exclusion. The second provocation is think universally in a brash and audacious way then enrobe yourself in humility and act on a personal level. Solve for one um, and for those uh, whom you serve. And finally, uh, this. realize this, that there is a direct path between your everyday tasks and actions, regardless of what job you do. These are the mechanics of your work. And they ladder up to not only your well-being, but the well-being of those for whom you serve. So to keep that, um, to keep that healthy uh, and keep in mind that every little thing you do has a greater effect across others, I encourage you to play. And in doing so, we could realize a humane well-being. Thank you for listening.